Thank you to the patrons for supporting the channel. Please resist the urge to blank. Welcome back. Well, with the end of the biggest series on my entire channel so far, we just gotta keep on moving. So today, as voted on by my patrons, we're starting a new series of videos looking deep into all of the SCP games. Now, if you don't know what SCP is, I'm gonna explain it in a second, but first, let me talk about how this series is going to work. Most of the time, I'll be covering multiple games at once. For instance, the next thing we're looking at is the SCP-087 games, from the original to the stairwell to SCP-087-B, because they're all pretty much the same thing. But I have to cover this game, Containment Breach, on its own because, wow, this thing is big. So let's just get started. The universe of SCP, which stands for Special Containment Procedures, is essentially a community world-building project. The basic idea is that there is a secret foundation, the SCP Foundation, which contains and studies anomalous and supernatural entities. This can be from unkillable monsters to just a vending machine that can dispense any liquid you want. While it is pretty well moderated, almost anyone can contribute an SCP file to the Foundation Wiki, where you can describe your own original SCP idea. There's multiple canons, other foundations in the world, and plenty of fan community content. The first SCP ever created was SCP-173, and was originally described on 4chan's Paranormal Board. Basically, it was a creepy weeping angel type creature, a statue that can only move when you're not looking at it, and can move at inhuman speeds. Except instead of sending you to a different time, it snaps your neck and kills you. The concept of SCPs grew, eventually going out of 4chan and onto various wikis before finally landing on on the SCP Wiki. The real origin of SCP games starts in 2012, with a game called SCP-087. We'll get into the game in more detail in the next video, but for now, the simplistic nature of the game, while also being terrifying, inspired a whole slew of other SCP games. And it helped that 2012 was really the inception point for horror game Let's Plays. And after one SCP game, there began to be more. Remakes or reimaginings of 087, games based on SCP-432, and of course, SCP Containment Breach. Soon, other platforms I've talked about before started to embrace the trend of SCP. There were multiplayer Gary's Mod game modes, an uncountable amount of Roblox games, and even a currently inactive development Unity remake of Containment Breach. For me personally, my history with SCP as a concept started in 2013. A SCP Containment Breach Let's Play was one of the first videos I ever made. Oh, there's no electric fence anymore. Why isn't there an electric fence? <laughs> yeah, I was pretty young, but the game was probably one of the only horror games that ever made me make noises like this. <laughs> I kept it up for a while, but eventually moved on to other things, but the series is still important to me. In fact, combined with his Slender videos, Markiplier's SCP videos are what inspired me to make YouTube videos in the first place. SCP Containment Breach was created by Regalis, a Finnish indie developer who had already made an SCP-related game before, SCP-087-B, a sort of remake or reimagining of SCP-087, the indie horror SCP game that sort of kicked off the whole genre. Instead of walking down endless stairs, you walk through endless hallways. There's a lot of early marks of containment breach in this game that clearly started with 087B, the focus on atmosphere and the procedurally generated rooms. This game was the stepping stone of what would eventually become Containment Breach. When he started working on Containment Breach, he was still in high school, and the idea of making games for a living wasn't even on his radar. But as the game picked up popularity, he actually pursued game development in college. The focus on development for the game was to stay away from cheap tactics and build fear from a genuinely terrifying atmosphere. However, in an attempt to keep the player on their toes, jump scares were added. <laughs> Now, community-created content is in SCP's very core, so of course the game would begin to have a modding community. It got so big that Regalis started working with modders to create updates for the game, and it's a good thing too, because the game didn't always look like this. The first release of the game looked 
incomplete, goofy, not at all like it does today. As updates continued, the graphics continued to improve and polish was added. A whole new section was added to the opening, along with more followable story elements and more SCPs. And while the game still isn't perfect at this point, it has just the right combination of indie horror crudeness that makes it creepy and polish that actually immerses you and keeps you engaged. So let's start with the basic premise. You are a Class D personnel. Essentially, these are test subjects that the SCP Foundation gets from death row and the prison population. The plan is to just have a routine test or checkup of SCP-173. However, during this test, the site experiences multiple containment breaches, meaning some of the most dangerous SCPs have escaped. That includes SCP-173. 173 kills everyone in the room besides you. Now your goal is to survive and escape. Now as the game goes on and you learn more, things start getting in your way of escape. For instance, the SCP Special Forces, Nine-Tailed Fox, have been ordered to eliminate all risks inside of the facility, including Class D. So now, you're not just escaping these supernatural forces, you're also escaping the only people who can stop them. As you continue on your journey, you also start to find out more about the cause of the containment breach. SCP-079, a sentient computer that was given control over the facility by the Chaos Insurgents, an organization working against the SCP Foundation. However, now the door controls are down, and 079 no longer has control. So you make a deal with it. Reactivate the doors, and it'll help you escape. There are multiple endings and plenty of SCP encounters you can have as you try to move through the procedurally generated facility. But before we get into that stuff, let's talk about the gameplay. Let's start simple. The game is a classic indie horror setup gameplay-wise. It's first person with a sprinting bar, clicking on door buttons, and collecting keys. However, there are some aspects that are legitimately unique. For instance, along with a sprint meter, there's also a blinking meter. Because your main antagonist can only move when you're not looking, they decided to add a little spice by making your character need to blink. Certain things can make you blink more or less from eye drops to gas leaks to gas masks. Similarly, you can become fatigued or run longer. You also have an inventory. With a limited amount of space, you have to manage key cards that let you into restricted areas, medical kits, SCP files that help you understand how to get past enemies you face, gas masks, etc. Also, like I mentioned before, there's the element of procedural generation. There are certain rooms and story important areas that are scattered throughout the map that is made up of hallways and rooms, a maze-like structure that is randomly generated every time. And kind of like Minecraft, you can even input seeds before you start a game to generate unique maps or to use ones that other people have created. It hasn't always been perfect, and I've heard tales of maps generating in a way that is game-breaking, but it's generally a really fun way to keep the game fresh. Now obviously, a big part of the game are the SCPs. Some harmful, some helpful, and some that are just funny. First, out of the way, I want to mention the non-SCP enemy. After a certain point in the game, Nine-Tailed Fox enters the building. Like I mentioned in the story section, Nine-Tailed Fox are a special task force that are there to neutralize any and all risks, including you, and also SCPs. Armed with FNP-90s, they can communicate and move throughout the building in groups in an attempt to re-establish control over the containment breach. SCP-008. This is essentially a zombie virus. You won't really have to worry about it unless you stumble upon the room it's kept in and breathe it in. SCP-012. This is a bit of unfinished sheet music that essentially takes over your mind if you get too close. It makes you feel the need to finish the composition with your own blood, which obviously leads to your death. SCP-049. This SCP looks similar to a Plague Doctor and can kill you with just a touch. He also has minions known as SCP-0492. These are reanimated victims he's killed. If given instructions by 049, 0492s can also become a danger to you. SCP-079. This is the sentient computer that took control over the facility. It can interact with the environment around you as you move along, and in the end, you'll have to make a deal with it to escape. SCP-096. Aside from 173, this is probably the most well-known SCP, a tall, pale, humanoid figure that is docile until you've seen its face. You then only have a small window of time where it begins to cry before it moves with inhuman speed toward you. 
there's no way to stop it, so your death is most likely inevitable. SCP-106. This is a creepy old gooey man. He's a very antagonistic enemy who can move through walls and floors. If he catches you, he'll take you to his pocket dimension. It is possible to escape by moving through the maze-like corridors, but that's very difficult. There's a better than decent chance you'll just be killed by him when inside. SCP-173. A large, vaguely humanoid concrete statue with a strange painted face. He's the first SCP you encounter. Like Stone Angels in Doctor Who or Slender in the Eight Pages, it can only move when you're not looking at it. If it gets too close, it will snap your neck, ending the game instantly. SCP-682 You won't ever actually encounter this as a full-on enemy, but it can be heard throughout your game. It's basically a giant, intelligent, invincible lizard thing. SCP-939 These are a group of lizard-like creatures that can use the voices of their victims to lure new ones. While not as prevalent as something like 173 or 106, they're still extremely dangerous when they show up, and you'll most likely want to proceed with caution. SCP-1048-A While SCP-1048 is fine on his own, this subclass is horrifying. A teddy bear made entirely of human ears that will attack the player, causing human ears to start sprouting from the player until it suffocates you. Not all SCPs are dangerous. Some actually can be really useful. SCP-914 is probably the most useful of any of the helpful SCPs. It's a giant machine with an input chamber and an output chamber. It essentially refines anything you put in it. Low level key card, it becomes a skeleton key. A simple med kit, take a bit more health. It's extremely useful if rare or good items are particularly hard to find. Now these aren't all the SCPs seen or referenced in the game, but these are just the most notable and you'll have the most encounters with. With all of these threats, it seems almost impossible to escape. So let's see how you do it. Let's look at the endings. There are two sets of endings, Gate A and Gate B. Gate A's first ending occurs if you make it to Gate A to escape, but haven't recontained SCP-106. That's a whole other can of worms, where you basically have to lure him back into his chamber by breaking some poor man's femur. If you fail to recontain him, when you get through Gate A, you will be confronted by the Chaos Agents, the one who caused the breach in the first place. They teleport you away with them, and what they do with you is unknown. The next ending occurs when you escape through Gate A and do recontain 106. Once you get through Gate A, you'll be captured by Nine-Tailed Fox, and it's alluded to that your character may be... special. Maybe the reason that you were able to make it through impossible odds is that you are an SCP. Now onto the Gate B endings. The condition for these endings are if you've disabled a warhead. If you didn't and escape through Gate B, well, it's about to go off. A siren goes off and, uh, you go up in flames. If you have deactivated the warhead and escaped through Gate B, then, well, Gate B isn't a great way to go because Nine-Tailed Fox will find you and kill you anyway. Best to stick to Gate A if you value your character's life. When it comes to the horror scene, and especially the indie horror scene, SCP Containment Breach was, and still is, a pretty big deal. The Let's Play scene was dying for something more long-form than Slender at the time, so this was the perfect way to make seemingly endless videos, hundreds of parts long, because of the constant updates and endings. Speaking of Slender, SCP Containment Breach really was like a competitor to Slender at the time. While Slender was more of a challenge and you would be following Let's Players playing it until they beat it, SCP Containment Breach was more story-based. And because the game is procedurally generated, it meant every Let's Player would have a different experience. Aside from all of that, it really popularized SCP as a concept. It had its own niche community before, but this really opened up Pandora's box. Most people's introduction to the SCP Foundation is through this game, and a lot of the imagery and the SCPs tied to this game are sort of connected into people's minds with SCP. The success of SCP Containment Breach really sent a whole wave of the genre of SCP games. If you want a good example of this, in 2012, when Containment Breach was released, there were four SCP games released that year. By 2019, nine SCP games released that year. So where does SCP Containment Breach lie now? Well, currently it's still supported well enough, and there's a very popular Unity remake, improving the graphics and adding more SCPs. The multiplayer Garry's Mod game mode eventually turned into a multiplayer Unity game called SCP Secret Lab, which puts the players in the same general world and concept of Containment Breach, 
that being that there is a containment breach in an SCP facility, and gives them different roles. SCPs, Nine-Tailed Fox, Class D, Scientists, each have different objectives and it gives a whole new perspective on how an event like this could play out. Alright, that's what I've got to say about SCP Containment Breach. There's so much more to SCP and this game even specifically that I just couldn't talk about it all, but if you want to learn a little bit more, I suggest watching Thaf9's video. Please continue to support SCP as a community project if you can, because it is one of the most interesting collaborative worlds ever. The next SCP game we're going to be covering? any and all games relating to SCP-087, the real origin point for SCP games and an evolution you won't want to miss out on. But until then, let me know if you thought of this video in the comments and suggest what I should cover next on my Twitter. You should also follow me there because that's when I announce when I'll be streaming at twitch.tv forward slash saganhawks. And yes, I am going to finally start streaming on there again. I'm moving into a new place soon that will be way more conducive to streaming, so look forward to that. But until then, I'll see you all next time. Thank you to the patrons for supporting the channel.